Hey friends, welcome to the Feeling Better Podcast. My name is Maria, and I'm the host of this podcast and the author of the book, The Feeling Better 10-4 Program, that teaches you a practical, effective, and insightful plan to help you overcome your compulsive gambling addiction once and for all. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about a couple of topics completely freeform. Up until this point, for the last 15 episodes, since the beginning, I've been reading verbatim, word by word, from my book. For those who can't afford the physical copy or who just prefer to listen via podcast. This is going to be a little weird for me because I'm so used to reading from a page and having everything already laid out. And so I'm a little nervous, not nervous, but worried that I'm going to miss a topic or forget to say something that I wanted to say. I didn't even write any notes down, which would have probably been a pretty good idea. I even contemplated writing everything out ahead of time and just reading it like a script, like my book, but I didn't have the time to do that. And so I'll be curious for any feedback if you think this is a little scattered and doesn't connect with you as well as the other way, or if you prefer this better. But I'm literally sitting here talking to you like I'm talking to a friend right now, and I have nothing to go on other than the three things that I know I want to talk about. So it'll be interesting. I have been getting several emails, and I love each and every one of them. Some of you folks have had some really great questions. I know I'm not going to have the time in this particular episode to address them all, so I'll get to others next week and then the following week, and as more pop up, I'll address those too. So it's going to be a good discussion, I think. But before I begin... I want to first extend a very happy Mother's Day to all of you out there who are mothers. I don't know if this is a holiday around the world, but here in the U.S., it's Mother's Day. And traditionally, I've always struggled with this holiday. As you know from my very first episode, my initial meltdown and midlife crisis kind of came from the fact that I was lamenting not having kids in my life. And up until this point, for the last couple of decades, when it's been Mother's Day, I abstained from social media because I just had a really hard time with all of the Happy Mother's Day posts and what makes a great mom and people sharing pictures of their kids and talking about how fulfilling it is to be a mother. And so I would just shut down, like not go on my social media all day, although I'm now I'm mostly shut down from all of it except for Instagram. but. Back then, in years past, I would just not go on there and simply text my friends or family who are mothers or people that I wanted to wish a happy Mother's Day. And they would always text back, happy cat mom day or happy Mother's Day to the mom of a grown man child husband or (laughs) something like that. It was always funny, but always kind of left a big hole in my heart. But now I am completely 100% okay with it because God has a plan for all of us. And I kind of got hung up on all of those Bible stories and Bible verses, Sarah and Abraham, and you know, all those different verses that talk about the blessing of children. And it made me feel like I wasn't blessed in that regard, that, that I wasn't blessed at all because God had not given me children. But that's not the case. And I know that's not true because we can say that we're blessed if we have a husband, right? Or a wife. And if we don't have a husband or a wife, then are we really blessed? You can have that same mindset. Or I don't have a house, or I don't have land, or I don't have money, or I can't do this. And so you can pretty much take every single aspect of life and say, well, God didn't give me this, so I'm not blessed. And that isn't true. That's the devil talking to you and putting that thought in your mind. So I'm good with it. This is going to be honestly the first year that I'm really, really okay with Mother's Day. And I I think back to times where I was in church because, you know, Mother's Day always falls on a Sunday and the pastor would give some kind of church message or sermon about one of the moms. Um, Oftentimes it was the story of Sarah and Abraham, but story of Mary or whatever, and and talk about being a mother and, and what that entails. And so sometimes I would just be like, I can't go to church. I can't listen to, I can't have you know all this talk about being a mom because it hurts so much. 
but it doesn't hurt anymore. And I'm being 100, 100,000 percent truthful in that statement. It does not hurt because I know God loves me. I know I'm blessed and I know he has a purpose for my life. And I know that I have things that some people don't and other people have things that I don't have. And we've discussed ad nauseum about how to be content with what God gives us and storing up our treasures in heaven and recognizing that this life here on earth is not what defines us. It's just a short blip compared to our eternity, right? And so we have to be content with what we have. And not just we have to be content, but it's a blessing and an honor and an act of faith and obedience to be content with what we have, to recognize that God gave us our lot and we are to do with it as much as we can, even if we don't have what somebody else has or they have what we don't have. Oh, wait, that's the same thing. <laughs> See, this is why this is why I need to write things out. And anyways, you get the point. So today in today's episode, I'm going to be talking about three things. One is going to be the medical condition that I developed that I know came from the stress of gambling. Two, I'm going to talk about a development in my finances that has kind of caused me stress, but I'm giving it to the Lord. But I just wanted to update all of you on it because, A, I want to be transparent and B, maybe some of you are in the same situation or C, maybe some of you have some advice. The third thing I'm going to talk about is a question that I received from a listener. And this is always fun because I have been getting a lot of emails and I really love the emails. I hope I continue to get them. If you want to reach out, uh, please reach out. And I know people are subscribing to my newsletter. There's a form on my website, thefeelingbetter.com. If you scroll down at the bottom of the homepage, you can just put in your email address and it adds you to the mailing list. And I'll be doing some newsletters at some point, updates, maybe even some raffles if I get to the point where I have busting to share with others. One of my listeners asked me a really great question about what I'm looking forward to most in heaven. So I'm excited to talk about that. So anyways, let's dive in. So I think it's episode four, week three, episode four, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, where I talked about how back in October, I had a work trip to Colorado and I had requested a refund of my airline ticket and then gambled that money. And then thankfully, thank God, won a jackpot and bought the ticket back, but then gambled it all away. And that was a really, really traumatic moment for me because I went from such a high, it was my first high, and then my first low of gambling away a jackpot. So that was the first time that I'd gambled away, like reversed the withdrawal and gambled away that jackpot. And then it was shortly after that, like that next day that I told my husband. And that was, I believe, in week five that I shared that particular story. So that whole week was just horribly, horribly stressful for me. Then at the end of the month, I went on my Colorado trip with my colleagues. We had a conference and a meeting and all of that. And so anyways, it was it was really great. It was a great trip. It was wonderful. And I really enjoyed my time with my colleagues and ate some good food and did a, a lot of intensive work. So I mean, it was a it wasn't just fun and games. There was a lot of work involved there, too. So when I got home, I got in on a Saturday morning. And then later on in that day, I started getting stomach cramps and feeling sick, kind of feeling achy and feverish. And by that evening, I was full blown sick. I had a fever. I had chills. But more importantly, or or the crux of what I was feeling was all in my gut. My stomach was clenching and cramping and I was violently vomiting. Not that you need to hear all those details, but let me just tell you, I couldn't keep anything down. Like I I had never, ever thrown up the way I'd thrown up like that. And I just, I had eaten all week, right? I was uh, on this trip and there's lots of alcohol and food and all kinds of, I mean, restaurant food and airport food and all of that. So I had naturally assumed that I had gotten food poisoning and it was so bad. I, I just felt so wretched. I had never been so sick. And there was one point where I came out of the bathroom and just fell to the ground, crumpled to the floor. And my husband came over. He's like, oh my gosh, are you okay? Like, what? Do you need to go to the hospital? Should I take you to the ER? And I was like, no, just just let me be. I just need to lay here. I just felt faint and just 
horrible, horrible. Like the worst, the worst sickness I'd felt in a long time. So naturally, I assumed it was food poisoning. And by Monday, I was feeling a little bit better enough where, you know, I work from home. So it's like, I don't take a sick day unless I absolutely need to. So I, I, and I contemplated, you know, messaging a couple of my coworkers and saying, hey, did you get sick when you got back? Because I'm wondering if anyone else ate what I ate. But I didn't because I don't know, I just, everyone seemed to be okay. I was getting emails from everybody. Nobody mentioned that, that they were sick. So I just thought, well, it was something that I ate that it could have been something I picked up like at the airport or whatever. So it took about three weeks for me to feel normal. I'm not joking. It took a long time. And even after that, I was like, I don't know, my stomach would just not be right. And then I kind of forgot about that. I mean, I didn't forget about it because it was so traumatic. It was just, I was so, so sick. But the episode passed or whatever, food poisoning gone. And then I went on, you know, I continued gambling. And then I had that jackpot around Christmas that I had reversed. And then, of course, my last big $8,000 withdrawal that I'd reversed in January and stopped gambling and then went through the 10-week program and dealt with all that grief and shame and self-loathing and regret and then and then, you know, the financial fallout. So all that stress happened over the winter, right? And then I launched the podcast and I've been recording and reading my book. But then at the end of March, the last week of March, I started feeling crampy again, my stomach crampy again. And I started feeling sick. It's the same feeling, achiness, feverish, faintness, like intense cramping, intense nausea, thinking I was going to throw up. And once again, I thought, oh, it must be something I ate. But it didn't get better. And each day for like three days, four days, progressively got worse. And I told my husband, this can't be food poisoning because when you get food poisoning, it gets better when you flush it out of your system, right? And so because it's getting worse, that tells me this isn't food poisoning. So it was a Friday. It was the last day of March. Saturday was April Fool's Day. And I told my hubby, if I get up in the morning and I'm still not feeling good, I'm going to go to the ER because this isn't right. It's just so, so painful, like ridiculously painful. I was hobbling like an old woman walking around. I couldn't sit and I couldn't stand and I couldn't sleep and I was so uncomfortable. So Saturday morning rolls around and I didn't feel any better. So I told him I'm going to the hospital. So I drove myself there and I walk in and check in and everything. And um, the nurse says to me, like, what's going on? What's the problem? And I said, well, I've got some really bad stomach pains and cramping and nausea, a little bit of vomiting. And I, I just it's not getting better and I don't feel well. And it's funny because she said, well, there's a stomach flu going around, kind of looking at me like, hello, you have stomach cramps and some nausea and a little bit of vomiting. Yeah, you've got a stomach bug, sweetie. But I told her, I said, it's not a stomach bug. Something's wrong. I just want to get checked out. And so they took me back into a room and then hooked me up to all the stuff. And my blood pressure was super low. And they gave me IV with fluids and just kind of ran some blood tests. And they could see that my white blood cell count was up. Like there were all signs that I was having some kind of infection. So the doctor said, you know what? We're going to give you a CT scan. So they took me back and gave me a CT scan and the doctor came in and said, oh, honey, you have a very severe case of diverticulitis happening right now. Like your colon is angry. <laughs> That's what she said. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, that makes perfect sense. I figured it was something I knew it wasn't the flu. And then she'd asked me, like, have you felt this before? And I said, yeah, in fact, it was way worse back in October. Not way worse, but it was like I would say it was probably four or five times as bad back in October. And she said that makes sense because usually the first flare up that you have of diverticulitis is the worst. And then the second one is not quite as bad. And so they kept me there for a while because my blood pressure was really low. And they gave me pain pills and they gave me antibiotics. And then they finally discharged me and sent me on my way. So that was my April Fool's joke. huh? But since that point, I have not been right in my stomach. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. It's been a tough road. It took me about a week to just 
move from liquids to somewhat solid foods. I was drinking broth and drinking tea, and there's this aloe vera juice out there that I get from the store. That's pretty much what I consumed for the first week when I came back from the hospital. Then after that, I moved to things like applesauce and bananas and mashed potatoes, but my stomach still hurt. It still was very crampy. And I just, I felt nauseous all the time. They gave me these beautiful little nausea pills. I don't even know what they're called. I don't recall, but it dissolves in your mouth and then it helps the nausea go away. And if it weren't for those, oof, that really saved me. So that was week two, eating those soft foods. Then week three, I tried to ramp it up a little bit and eat a little bit more in the way of meat. You know, they tell you to eat soft foods and mostly liquids, drink lots of water until the flare up has gone down. And then once your flare up is done and over with, then you have to eat more fiber and, you know, take things like Metamucil or psyllium husk or something. Anyways, I've been doing all kinds of research on diverticulitis. And then they scheduled me for a colonoscopy because they wanted to make sure there was nothing else going on of concern inside my <laughs> inside my angry colon. So anyway, that was a month ago. And I'm not joking. Today I'm recording this. This is May 11th. And I'm still... I'm still not right. I'm still not right in the gut. It's not bad. I'm not going to say it's bad like it was, but I still get cramping feelings every day. And I'm just really nervous about eating things because I don't know what my triggers are. And most people don't figure that out. But I've been doing a ton of research on diverticulitis. And I am 100% convinced that the stress of that time in October the worst stress of my entire life, easily the worst stress of my entire life, caused my body to react. I mean, without a doubt, this was a manifestation of all of that stress. This condition emerged because of all of that intense, intense stress and, and pressure and anxiety and, and just all of, all of that hardship on my poor body, the, the crap foods and all the caffeine and drinking all the fruit juices and not staying hydrated and not sleeping, all of that just imploded into this condition that I now have. And it's common knowledge that that we all understand that our bodies respond to stress, right? I've talked about it in my episode where I addressed adrenal fatigue and the adrenaline rushes and all of that. And so your body responds to stress. And I... <sighs> was so frustrated and disappointed at that diagnosis because a it could have been prevented I didn't have to bring that kind of stress on myself and I did and now I'm going to have this for the rest of my life b I love food <laughs> and I was just getting into the point where I'm starting to eat healthy I've eliminated the junk food and you know through my 10 week program I cut out some of those really bad snack foods and sugary foods and the fruit juices and all of that. I mean, I guess so on one hand, this condition really helps me to cut out almost everything. Like I'm still just basically consuming bananas, smoothies, some cottage cheese, um, a little bit of fish, a little bit of chicken. I cannot eat. I just I cannot eat any type of salad or any vegetables at this point, whether cooked or raw. Definitely can't eat any type of like oatmeal or anything. I'm just I'm so frustrated because I'm hungry. I'm just hungry. I want a nice big meal. I want to barbecue a big steak and have a nice big fat baked potato and a big side salad and some corn on the cob. And that's just not going to happen anytime soon. And then on top of that, I'm planting my garden, right? I've got all my seeds. And I started all my seedlings and I've planted my garden and I grow peppers and tomatoes and cauliflower and broccoli and peas, lots of squash, some radishes and beets, things like that. In addition to herbs, I grow potatoes and, and then I have strawberries and I have berry bushes. I have a briar, berry briar of blackberries and raspberries. And so the harvest and the, the, the farmer's markets and all of the fresh summer fruits and vegetables are like my favorite thing in the whole world. And I love to cook with them. And 
I just don't even know if I'm going to be able to consume them. And it makes me so mad. And I just, I so want to punch Satan for doing this to me. But on the other hand, he didn't do it to me. It's my flesh that succumbed to that temptation. I left the door and the window open. I talked about that in my last episode. And it it made it easy for him to slip in. So this was just a consequence of that. But I, I just... I'm so frustrated and disappointed. And so if anyone has any tips on how to best heal diverticulitis, I know everybody says you got to eat more fiber, stay away from the seeds and the nuts and all of that. And it's it's a little controversial because a lot of the doctors these days say that there's no evidence that avoiding seeds and nuts and all of that helps your diverticulitis or that consuming seeds and berries and nuts and things like that contribute to flare ups. So there's no evidence to that or there's nothing that strongly suggests that. But then some anecdotal evidence, people say, well, yeah, that does bother me or eating popcorn bothers me. But then they tell you to eat more roughage and you need more fiber. So I don't know. I'm like absolutely confused. And I'm trying to do as much research as I possibly can on it. But anyway, so that's what I have been dealing with these last several weeks is just trying to manage this and to ensure that I don't have another flare up and still eat what I want to eat. So the second thing I want to talk about, uh, my finances. Oh, friends. Uh, I mentally am doing really well. I had recorded that last episode, that final afterward conclusion episode, and felt so, so amazing. And I just really feel very comforted and very at peace with where I am with my father and my faith in Christ right now. And I'm, you know, tithing that 10% and I've got God to the test for one year and I'm completely confident and faithful in all of that. You know, I have no doubt about that whatsoever. But here's where I got a little stuck this past week. So I have this debt management plan, this debt settlement plan with this debt management company. And if any of you are curious as to what the second company is that I went with that I felt really good about that I re-researched. So if you remember the last episode, I talked about how there was the one, the initial one that took out the extra payment. And then so I canceled with them and then did more research and went with the second one. Email me. I don't want to give this advice over the podcast because I just I don't want to influence people. I'm not a, a debt management advisor of any kind and I'm not any kind of financial advisor. I don't want to give advice. But if you're curious as to what I used, feel free to send me an email because this company has been fantastic, like leagues above the other one. And I really, really loved working with them. But my debt settlement program required that they take $750 out of my check every two weeks when I get paid. And so that equates to roughly $1,500 a month, um, accounting, you know, for the the 52 weeks a year. But anyway, so we'll say $1,500 a month. The problem is, though, and you know, you get this You get this portal, which is really great. And you can see the things getting paid down. You can see the all of the creditors that have accepted the plan. And they give you this chart of like when things will get paid off and how long it's going to take. And it's just it's really detailed. It's fantastic. I love it. The problem is, though, fifteen hundred dollars a month is a crazy huge amount for us. We're not that wealthy. I mean, I have a good job. My husband, you know, he makes money. He has a good job. But we make fairly average money as Americans, right? I mean, that's a huge amount for us. And we have bills to pay. And so when they did this debt management plan, and I had talked to somebody on the phone, I'd said, you know, I want all of this paid off. And I would like to do it, you know, within three years. Like, I don't want to extend it to a five-year. And she said, well, I'm not sure some of these would even take a five-year. They typically don't for some of these these loans that you have, like those payday-type loans and a couple of the credit cards. So she said, we'll have to do a three-year plan. So $750 uh, takes care of all of my debt and interest. And, and when they went through the management plan, when they – this gal who spent like an hour with me on the phone. She was really, really great. She went through all of my debt and then she went through all of my budget and what we have to pay. Everything from subscriptions to things 
to our, you know, all of our utilities, our cell phone bill, our our gas and electric and all of that. And, you know, how much we even spend on groceries or all together our, our grocery and toiletry and paper products bill or whatever that is every month. And then also how much we put in gas and our cars, insurance, like every single stinking thing that we pay for every month got put into a budget. And then all of our debts were tallied up that we were putting on this plan. And then she basically said, well, this leaves you $230 a month extra at the end of the month, which in theory sounds like that should be enough, right? If we're literally putting in the budget everything we spend, every dollar for groceries, and and I know because I did the finances, so I was aware of everything we spent. And I, I I spend basically the same amount every month, whether it's groceries or whether it's our electric bill or gas or heating or what we put in our car, whatever, all of that stuff, the insurance, it's all the same every single month for the most part with a few exceptions. And so I thought, oh, I have this down. I know exactly what we spend. It was like $230 a month that we had extra. So I thought, okay, I can live with that. That's our spending money, right? That's our and and it included tithes too. I want to say that. So, you know, when I did this plan, I included the tithes. And so at the end of the day, $230 sounds like, oh, we could live off of that if we, you know, needed to buy something or get something that was not in our budget plan, we'd still have $230 left over. So the problem came over the last month here where all of these things just popped up out of nowhere. I had, you know, my diverticulitis flare up on April Fool's Day. So I had that hospital bill with a copay, $400. I also had medicines, different medicines that I had to pay for and get from the pharmacy. They had scheduled a colonoscopy for me. And thankfully, that was totally fine. Nothing wrong. Nothing other than diverticulitis. Not even any polyps or anything. So praise God for that. But I had the prep stuff that I had to buy for that. Then one of our cats got sick, like really sick, and we had to take her to the vet. And that bill was 150 bucks plus medicines for her. And then like my husband, (laughs) bless his heart, even though he knows we're on this plan and I'm paying this off and, and and we're on this very strict budget, he had this power tool that needed to be fixed. And so he took it in without my knowledge and then came back a couple of days later and said, oh, yeah, I took this in to get fixed. And by the way, that's, you know, $125. And I was like, what? He just he didn't think about he had forgotten. I don't know if he'd forgotten. He just didn't think about the budget plan we're on, because for all these years we've been married, we've had the money in our account where if he had a major tool or, or something that needed to be fixed or a repair, he just did it, right? He just he didn't even like need to consult. I mean, we consulted each other if there was a major purchase, like something over $500. Of course, we discussed that together. But both of us had this understanding that if it was something, you know, 100 bucks or 200 bucks, you just took care of it. I mean, we were both very responsible and fairly frugal. So we never worried about that in the past. And I and I guess he forgot. I don't know, because he was just like, well, we really needed this. And I was like, I know we did, but uh, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Oh, and then the other thing was this. So when they did our budget, they had taken our propane bill and our wood bill because we we supplement our our propane heating with our wood heating, right? And so they took the whole thing that we spent for a year and divided it by 12 to get our monthly budget. But the problem is that's not how you pay the propane company. You fill up your propane tank and you got to pay it within 30 days. And I think you heard on my podcast that I had filled up my propane back in January, but we had a really cold spring here in Michigan And the months of January and February and March were really cold. And we blew through that. Even though we supplemented with wood, it goes fast. And so, I mean, this is an old house. We don't have a high efficiency furnace. And so I had to call and put another order in for some more propane the first week of March. And that came due. And so my point was, my point is, 
that we suddenly found ourselves, instead of the $230 or whatever we had left over to use as extra spending money, we now found ourselves with almost $1,000 that we had to have in order to pay for these things. It just all happened in one month. I didn't even pay the hospital visit. I still owe that copay, that $400. I haven't paid that yet. Anyways, and so I... We put it all back on some of my husband's credit cards maxed out. Like I've been paying those down a little bit, just using like a little bit above minimum payment. And then I just, I don't know, I just, I I broke down. I started crying again. I started crying and crying and crying. I'm like, I don't understand, Lord, how, I, I, how am I in this position? I'm so sick of dealing with money. I'm so so tired of dealing with money. Yes, I trust you. Yes, I'm tithing to you. Yes, I'm storing up my treasures in heaven. Yes, I'm going to be abundantly blessed here on this earth. But I messed up and I'm still feeling like I messed up because here I am so short that I'm I'm, I don't have enough to pay for everything and whatever little bit I paid down on my husband's credit cards that are not part of this plan, I've racked up again, totally maxed out again. And now it's just, I'm back to like, I I just can't, how do I pay those down when I only have $230 at the end of the month? So I contacted this debt management company and chatted with the rep and said, this is just not working for me because We had these expenditures and thank God nothing happened to our cars that they didn't break down or we didn't have any major repairs. But what if something happens? What if our water heater goes? What if there is a repair that we need something done to our cars? We need oil changes. We need brakes on our cars. Like I just, my head is about to explode because there's not enough left over. And had it been my typical normal check without those, uh, I, I would have an extra fifteen hundred bucks. And back in the before gambling me, I would have had only a little bit of credit card debt that I was paying down. Not to mention we had savings plus a pretty healthy checking account. So we had more than enough to take care of these kind of things before my gambling problem. But now it's just we're coming up sh- massively short. Anyway, so I told this gal, I said. is not enough. I cannot do this. So she very kindly started going through my finances and budget again and asking me what happened. And she's trying to shave off a little and maybe thinking like, oh, we can extend one of these or two of these loans. Maybe some of them will go out to four years so we can give you an extra $30 or $40 in your check. And I I told her, I said, the $30 or $40 is not going to do it. I have zero emergency savings nothing. And we cannot be homeowners and have nothing in an emergency fund. And I, I'm not saying I, I want to, I, I'm going to default on all of this, but I need to stop this and consider bankruptcy. And if you listen to my podcast interview that I did with Brian Hatch of the All In podcast, he talked about bankruptcy. And I know it's a massive thing. I know it's on your record for 10 years that you're not going to be able to buy a house or buy a car or buy anything on credit with a bankruptcy on report on your credit report because it stays for 10 years. And that's so overwhelming and daunting to me. And I'm tearing up just thinking about it because I have the absolute faith that the Lord's going to take care of me. And God willing, anything that we need, we can pay cash for. But 10 years is a long time. And I don't even know how the bankruptcy is going to work because I don't think I'm going to qualify for the chapter, I can't remember if it's seven, that where it completely expunges everything and you have a clean slate. Brian mentioned something about gambling. Your gambling debts are covered under bankruptcy, but I don't even know if these loans and credit cards would be considered gambling debts. Anyways, long story short, I haven't even investigated any of it. I don't know where to begin. I'm a little overwhelmed by it all. And I all I know is that I just told the gal, can we just can we just cancel this? And I will take the next couple of weeks and figure it out. And they are so great. She said to me, how about we just pause it for one cycle for one of the checks, give you that $750, you know, in your check this upcoming payday. And then 
I'll give you some resources to talk to a bankruptcy lawyer and you can contact them and have some discussions with them. And if you decide that that's just not the route you want to go and you want to stick with this plan, we'll pick it back up. It's going to cause some late fees. It might, you know, irritate some of your creditors because we're technically skipping a payment and it'll extend it out a little bit. But at least we're not going to shut it down and totally remove that option. And you'd have to start fresh if you needed to do that. And so I said, okay, we'll do that. Now I have to have the conversations with the bankruptcy lawyers and discuss that whole thing. And can I just tell you how much my poor brain hurts? Oh my gosh, my poor brain. Every single day I pray for the Lord to give me the strength, to give me the peace, to give me the wisdom, to give me the understanding and give me the faith to rely on him to get me through this. But this is my mess and I need to fix it. I need to own it. And so I have to have those conversations. And yeah. Anyway, so that's the second thing I'm dealing with. The third topic is much more delightful and much more pleasant to talk about. So I had a listener email me and said, what's the one thing you're looking forward to most about heaven? You had described heaven as a new earth that God's going to create with you know no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, you know no more crime or any of that and we all live forever for eternity on this planet with new bodies and and it all sounds pretty amazing and I'm going to look into some of the resources you offered which again one of them was called Heaven a book by Randy Alcorn and also Pastor John Barnett on YouTube has several great videos about heaven. But anyway, she said, but what are, what's the one thing you're looking forward to the most? And without hesitation, the answer came to my mind. And I'm going to tie this in with the day that I had my colonoscopy. So my colonoscopy was scheduled at one o'clock in the afternoon. So I'd taken the day off because you've got to do this prep stuff beforehand and it's not pleasant, but it's not terrible. Compared to all the pain and everything I had with my diverticulitis and the pain of gambling, let me tell you, it was a breeze. But I took the day off because I knew I'd have to do some prep in the morning and then take a shower and all of that. And so I have sick time. So I just I took that day off. And that day was absolutely beautiful. I woke up around seven o'clock and had a little bit of black coffee and downed the rest of my prep drink, which by that point, there was really no point in tanking it, but I did. But anyway, so I went outside and I put in my earbuds and I sat in the sun and I listened to the Psalms and I could hear through my earbuds, the birds chirping around me and the morning was coming alive. The sun was coming up. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. Blue sky, sunshine, warm, like 75 degrees. We had a bunch of rain the week before, so everything was lush and green. And this is what I love about Michigan this time of year. It's just so, so beautiful. And so I sat there listening to the Psalms. And then I listened to a YouTube sermon, one of Dr. John Barnett's, the DTBM, Discover the Book Ministries one of his videos about heaven, or I actually was like tied to Revelation. He does this terrific in-depth study of the book of Revelation, if anyone's interested. So I listened to that and, uh, you know, went to the restroom a few times and came back out. And I was just sitting there in the sun, enjoying it. And then when that sermon was done, I listened to some praise worship music. One of my all-time favorite songs, worship songs, is He Reigns by Newsboys. I have loved this song for years and years. And I always picture when I'm in heaven, all the multitudes of saints, meaning all of us, the multitude of believers, just singing that song at the top of their lungs to Jesus. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to a crazy big loud concert. I have before my Christian days when I was in my 20s, I went to uh, well, two concerts come to mind. I went to a Kid Rock concert at the Palace of Auburn Hills. And I also went to an Audio Slave concert at the Fox Theater downtown. And just 
just massive crowds and loud and it was so incredibly overwhelming but so incredibly cool just to have all these people just singing along at the top of their lungs and like the waves of people with their arms in the air and I always think about heaven whenever I see any clips of concerts like that or or think back to those concerts because heaven is going to be like 150 times that kind of experience, right? Just multitudes of people singing at the top of their lungs, all in harmony for Jesus. And so when I think about that scenario, I always pictured the song. I always like love listening to He Reigns by the Newsboys because that's the song that I imagine everyone singing to the Lord, right? Another one is The Way by Jeremy Camp. That's also a really great song that I think about multitudes of people in a concert type of scenario, all praising Jesus. But anyway, so I was sitting in the sun and I had my earbuds in and I was listening to He Reigns and I just started crying. It was so beautiful. The sun was so warm. The birds were chirping back in the background. And I had listened to the Psalms and listened to that sermon. And it was just this really beautiful, leisurely morning drinking a little bit of coffee, drinking my gross Miralax prep, (laughs) but just enjoying it so much. It was just so relaxing. And so I, I explain all of that because this question from a listener, what am I looking forward to the most in heaven? My answer is the luxury of time. Because I was thinking about If I didn't have my colonoscopy that day, I had taken a sick day. And I thought about if I had a day where I could just do whatever I wanted, it would start off like this. If I had endless days where I could just do what I wanted, it would start off like this. Sitting in the sun, absorbing God's word, praising and worshiping God, and just reveling with a huge smile the beauty around me. And then I would get up and make a really delicious meal with no concerns about digestion, just whatever I wanted, lots of fruit and eggs and croissants, a chocolate croissant <laughs> and, and bacon and whatever else I wanted with it. And then do some housework. I love doing housework. I love cleaning my home. I just never have enough time for it ever. I you have to, you know, I've talked about how like I'm OCD and everything, but I just I and I'm a bit of a hoarder, which I'm 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 getting really, really better at that ever since I've come to terms and understanding about storing up our treasures in heaven and sold some things off and it, you know, garage sale and all of that. But I, I just I, I struggle with getting housework done because I don't have the time for it. I'm I'm constantly hustling. I'm I just don't have the time to get done everything I want to get done. Like to deep clean my bathroom takes, you know, it takes you a couple of hours. I don't have a couple of hours. I work full time. And and when I'm not working, I'm dealing with financial stuff. And when I'm not dealing with financial stuff, I'm dealing with pets or trying to do my garden or, you know, taking care of chickens. We have this, we had this whole chicken issue. I'm not even going to talk about that, but whatever. So then after house cleaning, enjoying house cleaning, which I do, then I would go for a leisurely walk, go for a hike. I have all of these gorgeous trails nearby with breathtaking parks and waterfalls and bike trails that go on forever. And our summer is so fast and it just, it goes by so quickly. We literally have what May, June, July, August by September. I mean, September can be beautiful too, but that's when the cold and sometimes stormy, rainy weather can move in. And so you only get a few months to enjoy that. And I just don't get to take advantage of those parks and trails as much as I want. So get up in the morning, leisurely coffee, spend time with God, praise and worship him, make a nice breakfast or brunch, clean my house and do chores, then go for a nice walk or a hike in the woods and then come back and maybe spend time in my garden or meet up with friends or go volunteer. And it's just like, I have worked. I've talked about this in my podcast. I have I have worked since I've been 19 years old, full time, sometimes two jobs, sometimes a side hustle or a side job I'm doing. And I've never, ever known the luxury of time. I've never, other than a couple of vacation days here and there, sometimes my husband and I will take a week and go camping. And that's always amazing because when you go somewhere on vacation or when you go camping like we do, 
you're not at home because when you're at home, you get caught up in the responsibility of doing things. You know, I got to take care of this chore. I got to fix and repair this thing, or I have to go do this kind of shopping, or I have to, you know, clean out this closet or whatever the case is. So when you go away, you don't have that. But that only happens, I don't know, altogether, what, uh, maybe 10 days? I mean, sometimes I use my vacation days just to get things done around the house, especially here in Michigan. The weekends are not always conducive to getting the things done that you want to get done. Like, for example, uh, I remember last spring or the, the spring before we needed to clean out our chicken coop. And we haven't even done that yet this year. But it rains for like three weekends in a row and we couldn't get it done. So finally, I just I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to take a vacation day or a personal day and on a really nice, warm, sunny day. And we're just going to knock this out. And so that's what I did. My husband's his schedule's a little bit more flexible. But anyway, so when I think about heaven and I think about the fact that we have an eternity, that we have all the time in the world to do whatever it is we want to do which includes worshiping God and communing with God and living in harmony with him. But he makes it clear that this is rest. In Hebrews 4, the author of the Hebrews talks about a final and upcoming Sabbath rest. And so that's how I look at it, that heaven is the final seventh day of God's creation. So in the beginning in Genesis, he created the earth and the people in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. So for us, we're doing the work now. And in our final seventh day, that will be our rest. And so even though I think about all the amazing things that potentially could happen in heaven, we could explore the universe or explore the world. Sometimes my husband and I are like, what if we can go back in time, like travel in time? And that's one of the rewards. And we can go back and, you know, I don't know, go back into the Renaissance era of history or go back and and spend time with Jesus back in those days and see the apostles or go back and watch the, the Wright brothers first attempt at flight or go back and watch our grandparents, great grandparents, or even ourselves, you know, just maybe like some type of strange cinema, (laughs) 3D cinema or something like that, where you can partake in history, that would be kind of cool. And we also think about the New Jerusalem's a city, and it's very clearly described as a city. So what kind of things do you do in a city? Dr. John Barnett makes it very clear that there's no ambiguity about what you do in a city. You go to a city to attend concerts. You go to a city to attend restaurants. You go to a city for some interaction with people or to do some type of, I don't know, event or attraction or commerce or you, you know, you shop and you eat and you drink and you you interact with each other. And so there's going to be that kind of life. But then the Bible also talks about country life. We're going to own our own land. We're going to grow our own grapes. And so that excites me too. And ever since I became a Christian, I've always had this, I don't know if you'd call it a dream, more kind of like a a vision of what my perfect home in heaven would be like. And it would just be this small, humble cottage on a beautiful piece of land with lots and lots of flowers and gardens, all the time in the world to garden and plant flowers. And never any type of darkness or harsh winter. It's just sunny and beautiful and birds chirping all the time. And and a little fireplace if I want a fire, even though it's never really cold. It's more for ambiance and and a big, beautiful kitchen, old country kind of, not I mean, huge, but just like a nice big wooden kitchen table where I can make things or bake things or cook things. And I don't need a huge pantry because I can go out to my own gardens or go shopping at the market or go to the the other farmer's market of the other believers or whatever. I'm sure there's like all of that, you know, I mean, we, we fundamentally as humans need interaction, rely on interaction and community. We love to eat and we love food. We enjoy social events. We enjoy our hobbies and we're fulfilled in Christ when we do the things that he created us for, right? And so if you read the book Heaven by Randy Alcorn, he very clearly uses scripture examples to describe that this is who we're going to be in heaven on the new earth when God creates that. But of all those things, out of all of that possibility that we could potentially do 
whatever it might be, your wildest imagination cannot comprehend what God has planned for us and what we might be able to do or see or eat or drink or feel or the jobs we might have. I mean, people ask, oh, is there going to be work in heaven? Yeah, probably. I mean, we're, we're I'm sure we're going to need to, to do things, but it'll be jobs that we love, that we enjoy, that we do for God. I'm not going to be sitting at a computer, you know, mindlessly staring at a, a screen as I type for hours and hours on end. And, you know, maybe God will use me to cook things or maybe I'll bake things or maybe I'll uh, tend to, I don't know, some animals or something. It'll be something we all enjoy. All of our work, if you're good at singing, maybe you you lead the praise worship. If you're good at painting, maybe you create art and um, you sell it at the market and who knows what the currency is going to be or maybe everything's free. I think out of all those things, the absolute most enticing thing of all is knowing there will be the luxury of time to do as much as I want, whenever I want. How You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, my biggest regret in this life that I don't really have any control over is having enough time to do all the things that I would love to do. Like, I would love to go volunteer and, and help people, you know what I'm saying? The local church or soup kitchen or the addiction recovery program. I would love to clean my house from top to bottom. I would love to go visit friends. Like I have friends that I adore that I I just don't have the time to go see or to go visit. I would love to be able to plant more, expand my gardens, go for more walks, do more exploring, visit with my neighbors. I don't even know what I would do with all the time in the world because I don't, I, I, I've never had it. Uh, you know, go camping or learn, learn some, oh, you know what I would really love to do is I would really love to spend time with kids. There's um, a couple of different children's homes, charities, oh, even like spending some time helping kids learn how to read or um, just mentoring some children. I, I would, I would love to do something like that volunteering maybe at my church's preschool, the preschool classes or something. I don't know. I, I have so much on my plate all the time. I, I don't even honestly know how people do it with kids going back to Mother's Day. I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. Remember how in one of my episodes, I think I was talking about social media. I have this friend She's not even really a friend because I'd never met her before, but we became friends on social media. I don't even remember how, but she she's the gal that posted what she was making for dinner every single night. And she's going to be next on my list to share the gospel with because <laughs> she, I, I don't know about now, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but she oftentimes, more than once, posted I'm so bored. I have nothing to do. I'm so bored. I watched all of Netflix. She must have, I must have seen her say I'm so bored at least, I don't know, at least a half a dozen times, if not more. And I just marvel at these people who say I'm so bored. How are you bored? There's so much to do in this life. I could retire today and never be bored for the rest of my life. There's always some type of chore to do or some type of hobby to do or some type of volunteering to do or just, I don't know, there there are a million things that I would love to go do and learn and experience. And I it just, if, if you're a person <laughs> that often says this, that you're bored, oh, one day I hope to meet you in person because I'm going to sit you down and show you how precious life is and how precious time is. Anyways, I'm not going to go on about that, but I think that's the one thing that I'll be so grateful for is to be able to have the time, just just to have time. As old people, when they are getting toward the end of their life and they look back on their life and they say, I, I wish I did more. Or I wish I communed with people more or loved more and not worried about working so hard. But I don't have that capability or luxury right now. And I really never did. And I don't know if I will. So, I mean, I may end up, <laughs> because of my gambling, I may end up working until I'm 75, 80 years old. Who knows? 
I pray not, but you just never know. So I hold my hopes to that. I hold my hopes to the promise of eternal time, the luxury of time. What a luxury. That's worth more than all the jewels on this earth, all the gold on this earth, all the precious metals, anything I could possibly win as a jackpot or a bonus on this earth. Time. I'm looking forward to it. So anyways, I guess that's it. I I feel like I really stumbled and <laughs> muddled my way through this. And I think what I'm going to do going forward is type out what I want to say because I feel like I'm missing things, that there are things I wanted to discuss. I didn't prepare any verses, which I love speaking to the Bible verses when I talk about some of these topics. And I'm trying to pull those up on my phone and record, but I've got to get going because I've sadly I don't have a whole lot of time. I've got some, I'm on my lunch break. I have some work meetings I have to attend to, and then I've got to edit this. And then tomorrow I have a full day because I have some appointments. So yeah. But you guys, I love you very much. If you have any questions or want to reach out and say hello, I pray that you're doing well and that you're able to abstain from gambling. I have some very specific gambling topics I'm going to talk about next week, but uh, I always love to hear from you. And I, I pray that you have a really good week. And until next Sunday, we'll talk again. Take care.